Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another video, this time focusing on Dragonflight now that the pre-patch is in full swing. Today I'll be breaking down everything we've gotten in the last two weeks in game, giving my opinion on it, and answering the same question that always comes around when a new expansion is on the horizon. Is it hype? So let us begin with what they've got at the very start of the pre-patch, the UI and the talents. While not the most exciting thing that's come in the pre-patch, Blizzard's added the ability to customise the look of your own UI as a base feature of the game, as opposed to people needing to go to add-ons like Bartender to do it. This is a welcome addition to the game, as while World of Warcraft is a pretty notoriously add-on heavy game, with what I can only imagine the majority of people playing with at least a couple of them just to smooth things out, it does help the minority of people who don't play with them, as well as showing a willingness on Blizzard's part to start introducing more and more quality of life features themselves, as opposed to just relying on the community to pick up the slack in that department. In terms of actual implementation, it's solid as a base, but could use a couple more quality of life features. My biggest complaint would be that some of the descriptions of different things like talking heads is a bit too vague, and could use a tooltip to explain it a little more, if not a straight up example on screen that you can move around, similar to raid frames. For Longer term players, all of these might make more sense as the talking head style of NPCs talking to you has become more and more prevalent in modern World of Warcraft. But for returning players like myself, I really didn't have any clue until I saw Bolvar's face weirdly placed on the screen what they were referring to. As Blizzard is clearly doing a massive push to get old players back after the massive losses during Battle for Azeroth and Shadowlands, having these little things be a little clearer would be very beneficial, but at least it's a minor concern, as aside from this it's a very competent system. What's a lot more than just competent however is the new talent system, which is by far one of the best changes they've made to the game in ages. The old big block talents every 15 levels have been replaced by a combination of the classic trees with more modern design. With every class having a dedicated class tree that contains many of the common features amongst all specialization, like raise dead for death knights, and then a specialization tree. From level 10 you get a talent point in your class, then at 11 you get one for your specialization, and from there you alternate talent point acquisition all the way till max, where at level 70 you'll have 30 points in each to spend. A lot of the things in the talent trees themselves have been taken out of your spellbook, so you really don't just automatically get stuff when you level, you must actually talent towards it, which I feel is absolutely brilliant. Having leveled a warrior in the pre-patch, it kind of feels like a choose your own leveling experience. Each level gives you a pretty meaningful choice, with very few of them being filler talents of just flat stat increases, which even then are fine as they're normally substantial, like plus 20% stamina in the death knight tree, so you can still feel the impact of them. I don't think I can adequately express how impressed I am at the system. It is simply a masterclass in game design, which I haven't seen from Blizzard in a good while. The way it marries the old talent trees of the classic era with the more modern, wide talent tree designs is simply brilliant. So with the UI system, which is clearly taking a lot of inspiration from what you can find in Final Fantasy XIV, the talent system which is clearly heavily influenced from the classic version of the game, and to look a bit forward into Dragonflight, the dragon flying mechanic being pulled from Guild Wars 2, it's really indicating to me that World of Warcraft is going back to taking a lot of the best ideas from other people and giving them a wow twist. This was a formula that worked so well for them in the past, and I do see it as a good sign for the health of the game that the developers are looking elsewhere for ideas to augment their own. Something that isn't pulled from any other game, however, is the new race and class which arrived this week with the pre-patch proper, the Drakthir Evoker. Unfortunately, this is an exclusive combo with no other race being able to roll Evoker, and the Drakthir only being Evokers, as this new race is really, really cool. Most of their racial bonuses, like a bit of extra perception for the new crafting system that'll be in Dragonflight itself, and some extra mastery are a bit meh, but the biggest thing that makes them incredibly cool is the Soar ability, which gives us a great insight into the dragon flying we'll get in the expansion proper. It's really fun, requires a good amount of skill, and sometimes you just want to go up somewhere really really high like Mad Hygel and just jump off it to see how far you could go. If I could, I probably would have race changed my Death Knight to a Drakthir almost exclusively for this perk alone. The only real disadvantage to the new race is that in terms of transmog, you only really get to see your shoulders and belt and that's about it. The rest of your gear aesthetic you need to show off via prescribed choices at character gen or at a barber shop, which while they do have a good amount of options to make your character look pretty cool, it's nothing nearly as comprehensive as a normal transmog. Although I will also mention that similar to Worgen, the Drakthir can shapeshift into a more human form and show off a full set that way, but if you can't look cool fighting, uh, why, why bother? 
Speaking of fighting though, it's getting a little bit more interesting with the Evoker class itself introducing entirely new combat mechanics into the game. Pretty simply, some of the Evoker's abilities can be charged up, having three to four phases depending on your talents. They get more powerful the higher the phase you release it at. While not really groundbreaking in terms of design, actually introducing something like this is pretty remarkable considering there haven't been a new ability type addition since the 2004 release date. I can only imagine that if this is taken well by the community, we might see other classes get charged abilities in the future or reworks to current abilities like changing up Bladestorm to be something similar for instance, or they might experiment with the different ability types and gameplay loops to just help spice up classes and combat, which in my book is pretty cool. As for Evoker gameplay more broadly, with this edition I'll admit I'm not going to be a grand source of wisdom on them. I don't normally play casters or healers, so I can't really speak for how they feel to play in comparison to others in those two categories. Having seen some of their performance in just pre-patch gear and LFR and dungeons, we can already see that their healing especially is pretty powerful, so I'll be keen to see how they shake out in Dragonflight itself when we start getting mythic and raiding stats on them when everyone's back on equal footing. Now of course, with a new hero class that starts at level 58, we do get a big special starting zone and quest line that this time is basically a complete prologue to the events of Dragonflight itself. I think you could have followed the Legion storyline without rolling a Demon Hunter or Wrath of the Lich King without checking out a Death Knight, but I'd go so far as to say that the Evoker starting zone is mandatory reading for Dragonflight. It shows how Razagath, the first big bad, gets free and starts to introduce the Primalist, the dragons on our side, and the stakes of what's about to happen in the world. Thankfully, we can do all this in the pre-patch to get that prologue, as well as just being a really good experience and a way to spend about an hour. It introduces the new class well, gives you plenty of chances to try out your new abilities, as well as letting you really bite into the Sora ability and let you explore some pretty exceptional backdrops and environments. This little snippet of the Dragon Isle does get me a little more excited for the expansion as the art direction is absolutely on point and just has that World of Warcraft feel to it which was especially absent during Shadowlands, so it's another big point in Dragonflight's favour. Another way the pre-patch shows off the art direction is with the new Primalist events that started last reset, which aren't anything too special mechanically, but definitely worth a mention. In short, there are three zones, Badlands, Ungoro, and Northern Barrens, that every three hours get a new elemental portal in them. These can either be earth, fire, water, or air, and seem to be entirely random which one each gets. Then in each of these zones, there's a bunch of portals and mobs just continuously spawn, with every 20 minutes a big bad elemental to top it all off. These mobs are solid experience, can drop blues to help you keep gearing while leveling, or just fill out your max level set with 252 item gear at level 60. And if you get dimmed elemental essences from each type of boss, you can get a permanent heirloom trinket to your collection as well. As this is a catch-up gearing event, you can also get an item called Primal Essence, which from any of the mobs and can be traded in for specific 252 gear, which is a pretty nice catch-up mechanic. Although this is pretty much exclusively for catch-up, personally I'm not a fan of how any of these sets really look, so they're not really going to be added to the transmog collection in earnest. Like I said, the event is nothing special, but the new updated elemental designs for the bigger bosses especially in each of the portal types are really cool. The geo-headed earth elementals especially impressed me, and it's a great continuation of the elemental aesthetics we've already seen in the past. So I'll be very keen come expansion launch to see what other enemies they've cooked up for us to farm on mass, if they can carry on the quality of the elementals we've already seen. The last thing to discuss before giving a verdict on Dragonflight's hype is to look at the small prologue questline and, and its cutscenes for how it's establishing the start of the new story. The first thing to note about the two new in-game cutscenes we get is that the lip syncing is downright terrible, especially in the first one for the Alliance where Turalyon is more lip flapping than even looking like it's synced to another human language. It's overall a small thing, but it does show a lack of polish which is a bit concerning. The story that's actually presented though is pretty solid and a good return to form. The basic summary we get from in-game is that when the original dragons took on their aspects, there was a schism in proto-dragon kind. The ones we've known about for ages, like the green, bronze, black, and red dragon flights, took the titan's gift, and the other group took more after the elements on the world itself. As a side note as well, although not explicitly mentioned, by the time the titans were on Azeroth, the elemental lords were puppets of the old gods, so I won't be surprised if they pop up sometime in this expansion. However, back to the story. 
The youngest of these elemental dragons, Orazagath, was freed during the Evoker starting zone by a Tauren Shaman, is back to scour the world of the Dragonflights, who has still much diminished after the events of Cataclysm, and we adventurers must help stop her. I should also note that Razagath is the first boss of the first raid, so hopefully we get further hints to where the story might go after her in the leveling process itself. The last important detail that we got wasn't through a cutscene or random dialogue with a character, but a completely reworked dungeon. Ulderman Legacy of Tear, which will have a mythic variant in Dragonflight, is a pre-patched dungeon where we go in search of a magical MacGuffin that apparently has the knowledge on how the aspects could regain their power. Of course, we're thwarted trying to get it by a member of the Infinite Dragonflight and the Titan Disc is lost to time, but the fact that there is a method of giving the aspects their power back is a pretty big note. I will just mention as an aside as well, this dungeon is very linear, but very well done. The Lost Dwarf boss, especially at the start, was pretty damn good. So, overall, I don't recall any of the Primalists or Elemental Dragons ever being mentioned in the lore before. However, in terms of Blizzard making stuff up for new stories, this is perfectly agreeable. It feels like something I could have missed in a Shaman storyline somewhere, or really just feels like it slots into World of Warcraft far better than anything they tried in Shadowlands. While only a taste in the pre-patch, if this is the kind of thing the new writers can do now that they've properly killed the older lore, then I can't find too much of an issue with it. Aside from the bad lip syncing as well, and how brief the pre-patch storyline is, it's nice to see them actually put the lore bits that we need to know about the new expansion in the expansion. Blizzard has had a terrible habit of having pretty vital lore hidden away in the books, and not really having as much of an in-game way of accessing it, which is one of the many reasons it's felt so disjointed for a while now. This is another one of those little things that does show that the developers might be finally listening and pointing the game in an overall better direction. So to conclude, am I hyped for Dragonflight? Well, not really. It's not because everything I've seen so far isn't good, quite the opposite, I'm very positive about the changes and direction Blizzard seems to be going. But I was also pretty positive about Battle for Azeroth, and even Shadowlands looked cool at the start. It's a Pavlovian shock response that doesn't let me get hyped for Dragonflight more than anything it's actually doing itself. On that same token, however, I'm not all doom and gloom about it. There's been nothing coming out of the beta like Azerite gear or Covenants where the community in large has said, this is a terrible idea, don't do it. And the response from Blizzard was basically, nah, mate, she'll be right. In that corporate American way, a lot of businesses respond to criticism. There hasn't been any tone-deaf story beats like the, this is the conclusion of the entire Warcraft story. Or just in plain insulting the community with the broker saying, oh, that realm chart you paid for in the World of Warcraft Chronicles. Ha, <laughs> that's not right, you idiot. Here's my new OC version. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But this seems to be a safe, by-the-numbers expansion for a game I want to like. So I might not be hyped, but I'm certainly cautiously optimistic. Thank you very much for watching. If you want more guides, reviews, and other MMO content in future, please like and subscribe below. No matter what you choose to do, however, I do hope you have an excellent rest of your day.